How are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning. So I'm a little jet lagged, but it's alright. I'm, I'm gonna get to this. You're gonna get to this. Um, so real quick, my name is Kevin. Uh, I am a developer relations engineer at Engine Node, which is a uh, they created the Graph, which is a uh, decentralized middleware for Web3. And we're, you guys are going to play around with that a little bit today. I'm also a developer advocate for Scaffold Team in what's called the Build Guild. Uh, we're, gonna, we're also going to talk a little bit about that, what the Build Guild is. Uh, but it's basically a group of developers that help support the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and the Ethereum ecosystem, obviously, is a, is a blockchain, right? Decentralized application protocol. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm also a photographer and filmmaker, so uh, you'll often see me at events shooting photos. So, a little fun fact about me this is my contact info, so you guys can uh, get that. It's basically got my like Twitter and LinkedIn or however you want to connect with me. Um, open book. Uh, I really love teaching people and onboarding people into uh, Web3. And so, that's my goal today is to really give you guys like a little bit of a foot in. Uh, by the way, who here is somewhat uh, familiar with Web3? Some of my contacts. It's, it's generally a newer, newer uh, concept. That's good. Everyone has a little bit of experience there, uh, or at least understand some of the concepts. I'm going to dive a little bit into it at the beginning. Um, the, the way I'm going to do this is we're going to uh, we're going to do like kind of a hands-on learning. Where I'm going to go through and show you some stuff, and then there's a uh, GitHub a link that I'm going to give everybody that has all the steps there. So the idea is that you can try to follow along, but all the steps are there, so if you do fall behind, it's okay. Um, and I'm gonna be here to answer questions and help you guys get set up. The most important thing is that uh, you need Node.js. You need like the newest version, I would recommend it, like 18 or, or higher, uh, because everything, uh, a lot of the tooling around uh, Ethereum revolves around uh, Node.js. And you need Yarn Package Manager. You need the newest version. Don't have like an old version if you're running Linux. Looks like we have a lot of Macs. Windows machines here too. Um, I, I'm not the best on the Windows machines. I used to be a Windows expert. I run a Mac, uh, so I'll try to help you guys if you have issues on Windows, but uh, those are kind of what you need. You also need Git, so obviously you need to be able to check out the repositories, uh, and then Docker. So Docker is what we're going to be using to like simulate the graph locally. Everything we're going to be doing for the most part is all local stuff. So we're going to be deploying an application locally, a blockchain locally, uh, the graph locally all in Docker, and so you then can take the port, uh, take your application to the next step. Okay. You know, I, I have this, but um, it wouldn't go on. Okay, so uh, so the, the the general thing we're going to do is we're going to set up scaffold leads first. We're going to I'm going to give you a demo uh, of kind of how it works, just show you a little bit, uh, tinker around a little bit. Then we're going to talk about Solidity by Example, which is a great learning guide. And then we're going to install MetaMask, which is a, a browser-based wallet for your, uh, for your web browser. We're going to talk about speedrun Ethereum, how to register there after you get your wallet installed. We're going to attempt to do challenge zero, which is uh, the very first challenge of speedrun Ethereum. You can think of speedrun Ethereum as this kind of like uh, set of challenges that you go through. And after you get through the third challenge, you get invited to the build guild. So you can actually start becoming a member, member of the community. Um, and then we're then we're gonna set up a, a whole different branch of scaffold needs. Test one two. And I just unmuted if I need to. Yes, but you're you're uh, currently unmuted, so it should be. Oh, good. and you, this is just to record to the camera. Yes, sir. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah, so generally we're going to um, yeah go through all this stuff. Extra credit here is like, hey, maybe we'll get there today. Let's see if we can get that far. Uh, but if not, all the steps are outlined in this blog post that I wrote. So I'm going to do that those last few steps. Um, and I'm going to talk about the graph more as well. So first, I'm going to give you guys a real brief briefer on Web3. So uh, a lot of people think like, oh, Web3 is this new uh, concept that's going to completely revolutionize the internet and replace all of Web2. Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> Web3, it has certain use cases. Um, but the, the concept is, I was sitting on the phone last night, and I'm like, how can I kind of relate this to like the, the path to Web3 from Web2? And it's like, you have to go down the rabbit hole, right? You gotta, you gotta dive a little bit into technology and understand it before you kind of like rule it out. It's like, oh, it's just some kind of like hype thing that isn't gonna uh, become, you know, uh, useful. But the, the truth is there's a lot of use to like web3 applications, 
And there's a lot of Web3 companies that are really building Web2 stuff and Web3 stuff. So today I'm gonna give you guys the red pill. Uh, you're gonna be like Neo here. Who here has seen The Matrix? Happy uh, you can see that in the Great. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wake you up. Uh, and you know, I, I also equated it to the matrix, right? Neo takes the red pill and then he wakes up and he's in the real world, right? Uh, and he still has to get hooked up to the matrix, right? And go back in, right? So you're still kind of like balancing this, this like web two to web three. Like web two is not going anywhere. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about how that works uh, with, with some of the tooling. Uh, and by the end, you will know who. All right, so um, so why do you need like web three or like some of these new concepts? We already have the internet, right? Uh, this is not news to, to most of you. The original version of the web, which before then it wasn't even called web one, it was just the internet. Uh, you know, it was really a means for like broadcasting like static information, right? You were just downloading files from a, a, a file server and looking at pictures, and there was really no like means for like interacting with the application. There may have been some JavaScript, but really everything was static, right? Everything was bare metal. Uh, obviously, there was, there was lots of cloud service servers that people were using the cloud for, say, like you would deploy your application uh, on bare metal, right? Um, and then the web kind of expanded over the last you know, a few decades, right? Uh, and so we see more complex scenarios where there's APIs, make applications need to talk to each other, they gave birth the idea of databases, hosted applications on clouds, virtual machines came into play, and then now like Docker containers, and Kubernetes, and it just got, it got, it gets complex, right? Um, and that's where dynamic content came in, right? Like people wanted to be able to use social media applications. And really social media was probably the, the accelerator for this this next journey that we made into Web 2. Um, so we're not here to talk about Web 1 or Web 2. We're here to talk about the concepts of like Web 3. So basically, the, the main idea is that you want to build something when you're building it on Web 3 according to some kind of like guidelines to make it uh, fit to these models. Decentralized in the sense that it can be deployed on a blockchain or a decentralized file server, or file, I should say, a decentralized network, uh, file sharing network. Uh, it's secure, so the security of the network is secured by some kind of consensus. So in Ethereum, it's proof of stake, right? And so there's this concept of like ether, which is the, 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 the you know, denominational value of interacting with the, the network. Uh, and that's what secures it, right? Um, and then on top of that, you have transactions, so messages. So you can almost think of like an HTTP request that you would normally send. Well, with Ethereum, you're, you're doing uh, RPC transactions and you're actually signing a transaction with a private key. So everything is based on public key cryptography. And so in order to interact with the network, you need a private and a public key pair and you need to be able to propose transactions to the network and sign those and you need to pay for the transaction with Ether. Um, and you do that by basically paying what's called gas. And we're not gonna get too much into the semantics of like how EVM works. I'm gonna give you a high level overview, but that's kind of how it works, right? It says anyone can participate. Anyone can generate a private and public key, and as long as they can get access to some ether, they can you know, be a part of the network and propose transactions and change the, the state of the network. Uh, and this makes anything you build on uh, Web3, in a sense, as long as you're doing fully Web3, censorship resistant, right? Uh, an example would be Tornado Cash. Everyone heard about Tornado Cash? I don't know if you know about Tornado Cash, but it was this kind of like mixing service. And all it was is a smart contract, and it continues to live today. Like technically speaking, it can, it can never be stopped. It is immutable and censorship resistant, and if I wanted to, I could bring out my phone and interact with the smart contract, because I have a public key private key combo and I have some ether. Uh, now there was some, some things there where they, they did some sanctions if you used the network, but my point is, is that the actual code is immutable in those forever. Uh, and again, everything inside of a smart contract essentially lives forever. So, and we call it the EVM. So it, EVM stands for Ethereum Virtual Machine. Uh, the other thing is that everything on the, uh, the blockchain, most of the time, unless it's uh, encrypted, is transparent. So you can see everything going on. So and because it's an open network, you can look, see all the transactions. You, if you send a message to the blockchain, everyone can see it unless you encrypt it. Uh, and so it, it's kind of, these are kind of like the, the ideas. So users connect to uh, a decentralized application just like they would 
any kind of web server, right? <coughs> now that DAP, if you're building it in a truly decentralized way, is probably hosted on like a, a, a decentralized file service like IPFS, or there's another one called Arweave. Um, but a good example is that some people build their DAPs and they just host them on Vercel, or they'll host it on, uh, I forget the name of the, the single file hosting service. But my point is that you don't have to go full into Web3, you can just kind of build your smart contract, build your front end, and <coughs> Nginx. Uh, by the way, I worked for Nginx for eight years, so if anyone has questions about Nginx, I can help you there. Um, and then the idea is that you're just interacting with the blockchain, right? Uh, I'll pause there for a second to see if anyone has a questions about this slide per se, uh, and see if I can answer those. And it's okay if you don't. We're just kind of touching the surface here, so. Any questions at all? No? Make sense so far? You see nods? People are, people are asleep yet, so this is good. All right, so basically, Ethereum is just this giant computer. So the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, is essentially that. It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of nodes that are all together on the blockchain communicating and sharing their, their blockchain. So the blockchain is just a ledger, right? It's just a uh, it, we call it a state machine. So what does that mean? Um, this is a very high level overview of what the architecture looks like for EVM. You don't really need to understand that too much. But the general idea is that uh, the smart contracts that you deploy, they have a storage. So they can actually store uh, information and they can store variables and updated values from those variables. So in other words, if you want to uh, deploy a smart contract that has a variable, and then you want to change that variable later, and as long as the smart contract is uh, written in a way that allows you to update that, you can do that. You just pay the gas and you can update the state. So it's this kind of like huge network of nodes that are all in sync with each other and all keeping track of all the transactions. And there's a lot more to it around consensus, but the point is that all the nodes are working together to keep track of the state and to secure the network. Um, and it's, it's stack-based. All that means is that uh, as you make changes to a, uh, um, uh, a state, uh, it uses stacks, so like it adds to the stack and removes from the stack uh, to be more really highly efficient. Um, and everything that's going on inside of this like virtual machine is like enclosed, like you cannot get access to it. The only way that you can uh, send in data or get data out is by proposing a transaction using a, a private key and a public key. So it's it's a secure way for you to go into the virtual machine, process some information, get it out, or change whatever you need to do, uh, and then that's your kind of like transaction. So you can almost think of like an HTTP request, but you're doing a signed um, message, and you're signing it with a, with a key, right? Uh, and all these smart contracts are is they're programs. They're just, just like you would write like a program in JavaScript, you write a program, in this case, uh, we're gonna be talking about Solidity. Solidity is like a high level language, for writing your smart contract. It's very easy to read, so if you, who here's, has anyone here uh, written any Solidity? Awesome, this is cool. Okay, so we've got a couple people that know a little Solidity. You guys are my helpers for the rest of the app. <laughs> they know it's good. Um, and so, Solidity is a really high level language, uh, and it's very simple because the EVM is actually very simple too. It doesn't have a lot of complex things. Exact example, it doesn't have floating Mac support, so you have to use big numbers. Um, it doesn't, uh, you know, there's certain object uh, limitations, there's certain byte limitations on the variable. So there's all these little limitations that make it kind of like optimized for its use case. Um, and when you write a program in Solidity, essentially you compile it down into byte code, and then that byte code is stored on the blockchain. Uh, so you can kind of think of it like, uh, you know, the byte code is unreadable, it's, it's not human readable. And so in order to interact with the smart contract at a later time, you need to have a, what's called an ABI. Um, and we're getting a little into the semantics and I'm gonna go into a little bit more, but an ABI is how you interact with the smart contract. So it's kind of like a map that says, okay, I have a smart contract deployed. What are the functions available? What are the variables available? Uh, what do I need to pass into each function? It's kind of like a, uh, a manifest of how I interact with it. And it's very easy to read and we'll get to that in a second. Any questions about this? No? When you, when you said state, are you saying states like transaction or is that two different things? So transaction is like when you actually like um, propose a transaction to the network. So like let's say I want to, I'm Alice and I want to send Bob one ether. I could propose that transaction and that's the transaction. And when I do that and it's executed on the virtual machine, 
that is the state that changes. So you can think of the state like a balance, right? Like kind of like your checking account, right? Um, so that's one use case. There's other variables you can create, and we'll get into those, but there's, there's all sorts of different variables you can do. Integers, unsigned integers, uh, strings, you can change a string, uh, whatever. That's a good question. Any other questions about this? You guys following so far? Okay. okay, so the cool thing we're gonna be talking about today and the thing that's like the magic of the workshop is this toolkit called Scaffold E. Okay, Scaffold E literally is like everything you need. So when I first started building like on Ethereum, I didn't really know where to start. I was like, what do I use? What tools do I use? Like what 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 type of language should I use? Should I use Solidity or should I use Viper? Should I use Hardhat or should I use Foundry? Or at the time it was Truffle or Ganache. And there's all these different tools. And the thing about Scaffold Leap is it just has everything you need. Okay, so the goal is that you guys can get up and running quickly and then start focusing on building your smart contract and focus on building your front end, right? Uh, it comes with a, a, a virtual machine, uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, like virtual Ethereum virtual machine called Hardhat, which is basically like a simulated blockchain. And then it comes with React and Next.js. So it's got a front end for you. And then it's got all of the, um, it's based on Yarn, so it has all the Yarn commands written for you to make it simple, so that you don't have to remember like all the syntax for each command. Uh, and so all you have to do to get started is clone the repository or check out the branch that you want to, to, to do, and then you do a Yarn install to set everything up, okay? And then once you install the dependencies, so Yarn install installs everything you need for the branch, Yarn chain spins up your blockchain locally, Yarn Start spins up React and Next.js on localhost 3000, just like you would spin up React you know, normally. And then Yarn Deploy takes your smart contract, which it comes with one just to like get you going, and deploy it to the blockchain. And then it, it, as you interact with your smart contract, this is all running locally, right? It starts building these blocks. And I'm not gonna get too much into the blocks, but you can just think the blocks of uh, a group of transactions. So. The way Hardhat's set up is it just automatically mines the block for you so that you can just do something real quick and see it right away. On the real network and on real Ethereum, it takes about like 10 to 15 seconds for all of the nodes to take your uh, transactions and then mine them. We call it, it's not really mining anymore, it's validating. <laughs> uh, Bitcoin's mining, Ethereum is validating. Um, and so this is kind of the hub of our architecture of what we're gonna be setting up today. And then, um, this is kind of what you what you're in, end up with, right? So you end up with a user interface running React, which yes, and then you have your blockchain, which is running Hardhat, okay? And this is the, the, the vanilla kind of thing that we're gonna do. Then, later on today, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the graph, and the graph is a, uh, it's a middleware. You can think of it like a middleware. So you know how like, uh, who here uh, knows GraphQL? People. So GraphQL is a, um, um, how do I, I always forget the exact terms for it, but you can think of it as a middleware API layer for like your data. So normally you want to store your data in some kind of database. Um, if it's a GraphQL database, you can like change the request to match the kind of data you want and get that back in one single request. The main thing about the blockchain and Ethereum specifically is it's really designed for writing to the blockchain. Designed to like post transactions and change state, and it really wasn't designed as like a application server. Really, it was really designed because the, the reads are a little slower. And so the idea of the graph is that you kind of sit it in between, like um, this, and it's this kind of like middleware index pro index protocol where you have your user interface, and it's and right into the blockchain. You just do it like you normally would with Ethereum, and you post transactions. But when you want to read data. Uh, you use uh, uh, the graph to index all of your data so that it's easily available in one API call. So you can think of like a, just a middleware API layer. Um, and so all, and, and there's a bunch of blockchains that are supported. Ethereum is the one we're gonna be focusing on, but Near, Optimism, Arbitrum, um, Arweave, IPFS, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that um, uh, protocol. So <coughs> what blockchain you're using. So, okay, so if you need help, after today, I'll just end the around today, but this is a, a link for all of the Scaffold ETH um, slides. 
And it's also in the GitHub, so if you guys want, you can uh, save this to your phone. But the most important thing on here that you might use later is the Telegram channel for Staffordy. Um, and it's really good because there's 2,000 developers in there, so if you're, if you're interested in Web3 and like Ethereum, it's a good place to be and a good community to be in if you have questions or want to kind of uh, go to the next step. Um, okay, so here's the workshop. So if you guys can bring this up on your, uh, your laptops, so go to github.com, kmdums1979, slash se 2 dash grab dash workshop where you can scan this. And uh, go ahead and pop that up. Give me just a couple minutes here. running locally on your computer. 
uh, it's an RP, kind of RPC provider, and it's got a set of 20 wallets with some like play ether for you to not have to worry about if you start using that ether as kind of like your bank, like it's like a it's like a reserve for you, so that you can do some testing, you can set up some uh, cool accounts uh, and interact with your smart contract, right? So we have this set up now, right? So now what we can do is go into the same. So we're gonna then we're gonna we're always gonna keep that open because that's kind of like our. Uh, blockchain and we want to be able to maybe print some stuff there and see what's going on in the console. So it's really useful to have it open all the time. Oh, well, we have to have it open all the time. Uh, so now let's go into <coughs> Scaffold 2 again. And now let's start with React with Next.js. So, so by default, uh, Scaffold 2, and you guys have noticed that I'm using Scaffold 2, by the way. Scaffold 2 is a new version. So they just kind of revamped Scaffold. The old one works fine still. But I would recommend using Scaffold 2, which is what we're using today, just because uh, it's got a lot more, well, it's, it's more actively developed. They're not going to be working on the first one at all. The first one uses React. The Scaffold 2 uses React with Next.js. So, and it also uses TypeScript and a couple other like components, uh, React components. But for the most part, that's what you should be using. Okay, so now we have React open. So let's go ahead and load it up. So we're gonna open up our browser. We're gonna go to localhost 3000. And then we get Scaffold Leaf. So again, Scaffold Leaf is a React application uh, built on Next.js. And I'm gonna give you like a real walkthrough of it right now so you can kind of uh, see what, what it looks like. When you first log in, you got like the night mode or the day mode. I think for like ease of view, let's put it in night mode. And uh, it's gonna tell you like, all right, how do I get started? Well, where's the uh, editing? So you can go into the index file to edit your your scaffolding file. This is where the contract is, which all the Solidity contracts are .sol files, and so there's one that comes with it called your contract .sol. Uh, so if we go to debug contracts, we'll see our contract. Oh, we don't see our contract, so that's because we haven't deployed it yet. So again, it comes with a, uh, a package, or it comes with a, a smart contract, so we need to deploy it. So let's uh, go into this fourth, or sorry, third window, go back into the directory, and let's do a yarn deploy. So yarn, yarn chain, yarn start, yarn deploy. And as, you, as I did the deploy, we can see that there's some like contract calls that are made, which are just RPC calls to the blockchain. And we can see who made the call and who, they, who, we, who I called. And then we can see our front end is some like uh, recompiling and stuff like that. But uh, the front end is kind of like any errors you're gonna get with React and XJS are gonna get put in the corner. Any errors you're gonna get with um, your hard hat or like console output is gonna be there, and your block numbers and stuff like that. And then um, you can see these like calls that are made. So uh, the RPC calls are like get balance, so give me the balance of the contract. Get the current block number. Get the balance again. Now get the current block number. You can see the block number is changing because it's constantly mining, it's trying to mine transactions. I'm not doing anything yet. Uh, and then in this bottom window, when I did the deploy, it automatically generated. Uh, uh, it automatically compiled the smart contract for us, and it automatically um, created what the ADI I mentioned earlier. So as I was saying before, when you when you deploy a smart contract, you also need an ABI so that your front end understands how to interact with it. Okay? So we deployed the contract from this to this, and it was successful. So now if we come over here and refresh, we'll get our our, our contract loaded. So what is this what we're looking at? So this is like the secret sauce of Scaffold Uh What it's doing is after the ABI is generated, and I mentioned earlier about the ABI, it's automatically grabbing the ABI and it's automatically building a UI for you, like a basic kind of UI that allows you to start testing your smart contract. So you can see there's a read function, there's a write function, there's a withdraw function. So these are functions here that we have. And then we have our state here. So this little box. So we can see that there's a string called greeting. We can see that there's an owner uh, with a, a string of the uh, characters. We can see a bool yarn right here. And we can see a counter. And then on the left here, we see that our, at our contract address. We can see if it has some balance of ether, right? And we can see what network we're on. So remember I told you we're using our cap. And so this is kind of like a high-level overview of your smart contract, and I don't know why I went back to that. Okay, okay. So 
The next thing you'll notice, and there's also an example of UI as well. So if you, who here is really good with React or Wish.js? Anyone here who with that? Okay. So it already has some stuff written for you so that you can see how you can interact with the blockchain using the provider and getting information from the blockchain. So an example would be there's like a, there's this kind of like button where you can like change the green to whatever you want. And there's a counter which shows you the counter. It's getting the counter state. There's a there's kind of like little thing here and it's refreshing automatically. Um, but for the most part, we're going to be in here with the contract today. Um, anyone have any issues at all at this point? Still working? Oh, the internet? The internet kind of slow? Or the install? Install. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, it does take I, uh, I usually do it ahead of time. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised mine went so fast, honestly. Are you guys, what network are you guys on? You guys on the uh, Western Conference? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Everyone's downloading packages right now. <laughs> like everybody's. It's all these packages. Okay, so. Well, that's okay. While you guys are doing that, I'm going to give you guys a real brief demo and walk through how it works. I don't want you guys to feel like you have to follow along with what I'm doing, but I want you guys to see what I'm doing and how I'm doing it so that you can kind of understand these steps. They're not in the, uh, so if, if you've been following along or if you're going to follow along in a little bit, we did the git clone, we went into the directory, did a yarn install, we did a yarn chain, we did a yarn deploy. In the last kernel, uh, we did a start, and we started the application. So the steps are not in here. I'm going to add these later um, of what I'm going to do. It's not part of the workshop, but I just want to give you like a high level overview of how scaffolding works. So let's let's do that right now. Okay, so I talked about the smart contract, right? So let's let's go into the directory for the project in VS Code. Okay? So I use VS Code. Uh, you can just install uh, the requirements. I would recommend that you guys do a couple things. First, I would recommend that you do um, uh, settings, extensions, and install uh, Solidity here. It's a package uh, that does highlighting for you of the Solidity files. Uh, you also might want to install the JavaScript one if you don't already have it. Um, it's pretty much the main ones you're going to need. Um, and then here we have the, the structure of the directory. So, it's rather simple. Here's the package file that has all the dependencies, and it also has all the scripts there. So if you know Yarn, Yarn has a set of, you can create, create scripts. And these are all the commands that you can use with scaffold E here. So I get Yarn uh, change, spins up part hat. So this is actually what gets executed for you, so that you don't have to know. Um, this is a mono repo. Am I saying that right? Mono repo. So it's uh, designed in a way that you have multiple packages. And we're doing workspaces, we're using your workspaces. But all you need to know are these kind of like simple commands. So if you're ever not sure what command you can type, you can look inside this package JSON and it'll show you some commands here. But the packages folder is where we're going to be spending most of our time. And today, most of the time, we're going to be spending hard hat. So there's two packages there's hard hat, which is our back end, React, React Next.js, our front end. So we're going to go into hard hat, we're going to go into contracts. And we're going to go into your contract. So what do we got here? Let's move this over a little bit, and let me kind uh, of okay. That's okay. Uh, I'm going to walk you guys through it line by line. So this is a smart contract. Um, it's basically got a, a a version here on the top. So in, in Solidity, you have to tell the smart contract what compiler you want to use to deploy the contract. And so this is saying, all right, we'll only use higher than eight. Point eight, and don't use anything about nine, right? Point nine, and then there's a license field. You'll just get an error if you don't have a license, so add a license, um, and then you can do imports just like you would do in like JavaScript or something like that. And the imports that we're, we already have configured is our hard hat import. Again, uh, these contract calls that we're getting right here. You see how we see the pretty print of what's going on with the contract address? Um, that is a hard hat console. So we're actually able to log to the console uh, using that. So that's why that's there. And then we have some like comments. But more importantly is here's the contract. So the contract that we have here, there's a lot of stuff. I'm just going to kind of wipe some stuff out because I want to show you guys like how you make changes. I'm going to I'm going to wipe this out. I'm going to get rid of the uh, owner constructor. 
I'm just gonna make some changes. Do you have something really know what I'm doing? But I'm basically just removing some modifiers. Uh, I'm gonna remove the And I can also see the receipt. So the receipt 
is the response that comes back from the Ethereum virtual machine letting me know that the transaction was successful. So I, from this address to this address, it's just basically a, a JSON object that has all the information about my transaction so that I can verify that it was done correctly. I can also, uh, tell, it tells me how much gas, how much I paid for gas. Um, I didn't really touch on it much, but every time you make a state change, you need to pay gas. And so the, the general idea is that the network is secured by Ethereum and all of these nodes are running and in order to have someone propose your transaction on the blockchain, you gotta pay them a little gas to pay for the computation that's gonna happen inside the smart contract. So, you know, normally you spin up an AWS server or a Google Cloud server, and uh, you're paying them for your monthly fee, right? And then, you know, that's kind of what's doing all your computation. Well, the Ethereum virtual machine is a decentralized network, and so there has to be some incentivization layer, and so that is done by fees and gas. So you pay a little bit of fee, you might pay a tip, you can also tip on the network. So like, say, let's say you have a transaction that's very important that it gets put in right away. You can pay a little more for that and they'll, it'll, the miners will pick it up ahead of everyone else because you paid a premium. It's an open market. So gas is an open market uh, of computation. Uh, and so, you know, to deploy a small state change of a couple bytes, it's probably not a big deal. It's not a lot of gas, you know, maybe a dollar, maybe less, maybe 20 cents, I don't know. Uh, it's actually not in dollars, it's in meters, but you get the idea. You're basically paying this gas. So this gives you the receipt, um, and then we can see that our, our things change. So if we go to the UI, now we'll see that our UI is adapted automatically as well. We see the counter went up, so it went from zero to one. And we can we also make the change here if we wanted to, like Kevin's here, a little bit like this. And it will automatically update it. It might take a second. There it goes. So, um, you know, you'll notice this button here is a little different than what I did here. Here I just changed the state uh, manually using the debug contract tab. Here, there's this price here that's set automatically. So it actually sends an ether into the contract, which we'll get to that in a little bit. But the smart contract can act as a bank, okay? So let's, let's go back to our smart contract here. And let's just start toying around with it a little bit. We're not gonna use the deploy script anymore. We're just going to focus on the your contract here. Um, so let, let's do something interesting. So the, one of the first things you'll learn when you're uh, deploying a smart contract is you need some kind of way to control the contract after it's been deployed. Because if you uh, deploy a contract and you want it to live forever in an automated way, that's fine. And if you don't have if you don't have ownership of the contract, it will never die. It literally is on the blockchain forever. But if you're using it as a bank to store information or store uh, value probably going to want to be able to get that value, at, value out. So it's just like an application for your, uh, that you're going to create with whatever backend you need, you're going to have to spin an authentication scheme, right? Well, with uh, your virtual machine, it's all interacting with public key cryptography, and so we have this burner wallet that we can use as our authentication. We can use public key cryptography to sign the transaction. So let's do that. Let, let's create a new uh, variable. So we're going to say address, owner, or actually let's call it the boss equals, and then let's grab our public address here. So we have this address that's in our burner wallet, and we can say that the boss is this guy. So that's our long string. <laughs> it's not very user friendly, but this is my address on my on my on the Ethereum virtual machine. So if you guys uh, were on the same network as me, you can punch this address in, and you can send me some ether. All right. Uh, let's save that, and then down here, what we're going to do is anyone who wants to set the new greeting, we're going to require something. So there's a, yeah, question. Good question. So the, the question was, is that an address you want to hide? No. So that's the public address. So uh, you want to hide your private key. So your private key is a, a little longer, and it's your uh, randomly generated private key. And so uh, quick, quick lesson. So public key cryptography, the concept is you have a private key, and you have a public key. And when you want to send a message, you have to sign it with your private key so that someone can prove that you signed the transaction, right? So reverse, so we do the reverse authentication of the signature. So uh, the private key gives you power to sign and act as that person. The public key is just an entry point to be able to receive messages or receive a transaction. So this you don't have to worry about. When we get to MetaMask, I'll show you what you need to hide. Uh, and that's the, the C phrase and uh, the private key. Okay. 
So here we have this public key. That's a really good question. Any other questions? Are you guys kind of following along? Does this make sense? Does anyone have an issue setting any of this stuff up yet? No? Okay. I'm trying to go slow, but I'm trying to go at an interesting pace, so if I'm going too fast, just let me know. Um, right, like I said, right now it's kind of just like me showing you some stuff. So, all right, so the first thing you're gonna uh, wanna do is access control. So what we're gonna, we're gonna do is like this function that allows us to set the greeting, we wanna set a requirement that says only the person that signs the transaction uh, that is equal to this address is allowed to call that function. So let's say this. So you have access to some variables at, at the time that the transaction is sent inside of Solidity, and one of those is called the message that sender. Okay. And um, the message that sender is the person who's calling the function or or sending the message and signing the transaction, the public key of that person. And then uh, the boss is what we're trying to check for. So we're saying, all right, this message that sender needs to be the boss, otherwise not the boss, something like that. And then close off, okay? So let's save that and then redeploy. And now what we're gonna be able to do is, let's go to a uh, new window. So let's go to new incognito window, okay? And then let's go, let me just kind of open this so you can see. Let's go to localhost 3000. Now what you'll notice is we got a new burner wallet. So here I have this one that's kind of this like green, yellow, purple blocky dude. And then in my incognito one, I got this solid purple guy. It's a new address. So I can do the same thing. Get some ones from the faucet, go to debug contracts, come over here to green and say, I am not the boss. Yes. And hit send. And it's gonna give me a message from the boss. So I kind of created a access control rule for this function. So that's your kind of like first thing, right? All right, maybe you want to control a function. We're gonna use that later, but that's not quite interesting. It, and if I come over here now, I can say, well, I am the boss on this one, and it works, right? Because I'm essentially the owner of this contract. But that's not a very interesting smart contract. Um, usually if you have a function that you want to control, it's usually because it has some kind of monetary control, like you need to go with job funds, which we'll get to in a sec. Uh, but for the most part, you're gonna want to uh, uh, make the contract a little more interesting. So let's do something a little different instead. We're gonna go into, let's get rid of this owner variable, or the boss variable. Let's get rid of this requirement statement. And let's instead do a different requirement. So let's require that the message dot value is equal equal to a price that we're gonna set. Otherwise, a minimum limit, <laughs> like this. So what we're gonna say is, all right, the person that's sending it doesn't matter. Any, any sender that, that interacts with this function can send it, but the value needs to equal a price. So let's set that price. So let's go uh, uh, uint, so unsigned integer is anything zero or above. Um, real quick note on variables, like they're limited by byte size. So 256 is the largest size that you can, 256 bytes that you can store in a variable, uh, at least an in, integer, an integer, or an integer. If it's an integer, it can have a negative value. If it's a unsigned integer, it's only positive value, zero or positive. Um, so we say un unsigned integer, uh, public, price, and equals 0 0.01 ether. So we're, you notice we're using ether now. So ether, a real quick note about this. Ether is a denominational value of Ethereum. So one ether right now is like almost $2,000, right, on the main, main net. <laughs> we have a lot of ether, so it's worth nothing. But uh, for the most part, ether in its high value is that sort of value. So we're saying 0 0.01, so this is about 20 bucks. Um, Ether has a debate because I remember we don't use floating point math in Ethereum, and so we have to take our, our denomination and we have to break it down into decimal or into uh, uh, decimals essentially, or not decimals. What am I thinking? Um, a smaller increment. So one ether is times ten to the eighteenth power in what's called uh, so uh, times ten to the 18th power in way. So way is the smallest denomination, 
right, of, of ether. What's cool is solidity, you can just write it here, or you can write it as way. So if you just write the number straight out, like I can tell you what this is, it's probably like, I don't know, tw like fifth, maybe 12 zeros or something like that. So it would be one, zero, 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 zero. But this is the, the user-friendly way to do it, is just type it in ether, and then it does the math for you inside solidity, and it determines what that is at the time of the compile. So let's save that right here, and deploy. And so now if we come over here to our uh, app again and go to debug contracts, we can set the greeting to foo like this and try to hit send. And it's gonna say, pay, pay me more money, right? I need to send some value. Now you would think you could just come here and say 0 0.01 ether, right? And hit send. What's it gonna tell me? Nope, we can't use decimals. We have to use, uh, we got a weird underflow because we're using under, uh, uh, a lot. We're not using enough ether. We're, we're using a, a smallest fraction. And so there's this cool button here that will do the math for you. So it will determine what that needs to be in way. So you just click that, there we go. So if we do that and hit send, then it works successfully. See? So now what do we have here? We have our price variable that was, that was here. But more importantly, we have our smart contract. And what do we see now? It has a balance. So now the smart contract is acting as a bank. It let someone interact with the function, write the function, uh, or write the state to this new variable, and it stored that value of ether. Now there's one problem with the, the contract, and it's a pretty important one. <laughs> what, what's, what's missing? Anyone can tell me? We have no way to get the money out. There's no withdrawal function. I took it out earlier. So let's, let's put it back in, okay? And I'm just showing you guys kind of a little bit of how you tinker with scaffold leaf, and you can see this kind of like process that you get in where you, you know, change your smart contract, do a deploy, test it in the UI, and it's kind of like a balancing act, right? And you can start to see everything that's happening. So let's 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 instead or let's now let's add a function to withdraw. So function withdraw. We're gonna say that it's a public. Function so anyone can call it on the blockchain. It's not a private. If it was private, only the smart contract could call it. So you can do private functions that are internal, but we want to make it public because we need to be able to access it from our private key. And we're gonna do like this. This is where it gets a little complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through this. So we're gonna set a boolean called success. Otherwise, we will not set a boolean. And then what we're gonna do is message that sender. So whoever calls this function, the sender, we're going to do what's called a call, and we're going to pass in what value we want as a JSON object, and we're going to grab the balance of this smart contract, like this, and then we just need to end it off like this so that um, we're error checking or me error messaging, and we're just going to leave blank. Now there's one problem with this, so, so we're sending a Boolean arm called success, if someone does successfully call this function, we're going to do a call against their address. So anytime you want to withdraw funds from a contract, you should do a call. It's kind of like the safest way to do it. And we're going to set the value as the balance of this smart contract. So it's address of this smart contract's balance. So balance is a, a, a part of the object of the smart contract. And, uh, but there's one problem. We don't want anyone to call this, right? We only want the owner to do that. So how do we do that? So if I was to do it right now, let's go ahead and do it. You're on deploy. It's going to let me do it. And if I had this smart contract and I came over here and I did foo, 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 sent a bunch of transactions, now the, the thing's got some decent amount of ETH in it, right? And now this kind of bad actor came in here and saw that and said, oh, well, I'm going to withdraw it. They can click the withdraw and they can grab all those funds, right? We don't want that. We want to set up some access control. So we could do the require statement that we did earlier, but I'm going to show you a better way. And it, go, it goes into a little bit about how imports work with scaffold ETH, or with Solidity, sorry. So um, there's a company called Open Zeppelin, and they do like smart contracts that are kind of like trusted and like certified. And one of those is uh, the import. So let's go here, import. Uh, and one of those, I'm sorry, one of those is called Ownable. So Ownable is a way to uh, set up access control using Open Zeppelin's contract. So we can just import it like this. We already installed the package earlier because it's part of Scaffold E. 
and then we can do your contract is ownable, like this. And so what it's saying is that our contract's gonna get deployed, and then it's gonna import all of this functionality that comes into this Solidity file, which is available online. If you just go to ownable on OpenZeppelin GitHub, it'll show you it. But it's got a bunch of functions written for us, it's got a bunch of uh, variables, it's got modifiers, it's got a lot of code written for us that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you can think of it as like a, a thing. So let's save that, and we're almost done here, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna go into actually you guys doing some stuff. So I deployed, so that worked, but now we need to set up the modifier. And here we can just do only owner, like this. Save, redeploy again. And now if we come over here and make some changes on this one, so let's go uh, Kevin is cool, and 0 0.01 ether, send, 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 I'll send a few more transactions, it's got some value now. Now if we come over here to our kind of like inco our incognito guy, right? And we want to get this ether out, 0 0.05 ETH, which is $92.84. And if I hit withdraw, nope, I'm not the owner. So now we've set up a bank, we've set up a function that takes value, it's acting as a bank, and we've restricted the withdraw of that function as well, so that no one can come in there and be a bad actor and withdraw the funds from the smart contract, right? One more thing I just want to show, and then we'll get, you guys can start toying around. So the last thing is, we have this price, right, that we set, it's right here. So one ether is equal to, I'm going to put this here, 10, times 10 to 18 uh, away. And then, but I want to change the price in a curve. So next thing you'll learn with, with, with um, smart contract is especially if you're looking at like DeFi, which is this concept of like decentralized finance, uh, is you might want to like have a function in your smart contract that has a, a curve. So let's say I said price is equal to price times uh, 101 divided by 100, like this, save. So this is gonna basically increase the price by 1% every time someone calls the function, do a deploy. And now if we come over here to our thing and try to do a, a transaction, let's do it once, it worked, but the next time what happened? The price changed. We've increased it by a percent. So if I try to send it again, I gotta pay more money. So now I gotta come here and do zero point, uh, well I gotta do it away so we can do it like this one. This. Now it's going to let me. Now it went up again, right? So we were able to keep this cool, this cool price curve. This is where DeFi, you know, like you see these DeFi protocols like Uniswap or all these different cool like Web3, that's how they do it. They create price curves and like uh, you know, interest and, and there's all sorts of cool things you can do with your smart contract um, in that sense. Okay, so let's go back to uh, this. So that's a demo. If you guys wanna kind of go through that, um, you guys can, but I, I wanna just make sure everyone's up and running first. Is everyone uh, up and running? Is everyone having issues getting scaffoldies going? No? You are still? So we got one person? Okay, so I think that's a good, like, a brief overview. Let's try to get you guys up and running. Do you guys wanna take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and then we'll dive into you guys actually doing some hands-on stuff. Does that sound good? You guys down for that? Okay, so come back, be back by 11.10. Or sorry, yeah, 11.10. And then uh, I'm gonna help him, and then if you guys have questions during the break, I can help you. Okay, done, okay, finally. Okay, so it's the same kind of thing. Yarn chain to spin up the hard hat chain. Yarn start. Oh man. Oh, my other chain's still up. <laughs> so if you're doing your uh, this, make sure you drop down the other chain. Uh, so I I have the other chains. You guys can close those out for now because we're gonna we're not gonna use the uh, old repository for the graph stuff either. So that's okay. So just. Just stop your old chains and stop your old, old uh, Next.js. And we're gonna be using this one now. So let's try that again, yarn chain. And then over here, yarn start. So it's the same thing, yarn chain, yarn start. But we're gonna get a different UI because it's the old version of Scaffold ETH. It takes a little longer for React to start, as I mentioned before. And then we're gonna do our yarn deploy. So it's the same steps, everything's the same. The UI is just gonna look a little different. Okay, so our, our contract was deployed. React is still starting. There it goes. 
and now it's up. Okay, now this is the old version of scaffold D. It's okay, it's got the same kind of concepts. It's got the debug contract folder, it just looks a little different. Now we'll see that our contract is a lot more advanced because it's an NFT contract, okay? Uh, by the way, I just wanna to briefly touch on what an NFT is. I know people are like heard the term NFTs. I think everyone kind of understands the idea, but when it comes to the actual Ethereum side of what an NFT is, it's just a smart contract, right? It's a contract that has functions. It allows you to, uh, the, the main difference is that Ethereum is a, a fungible token. You can have you know, one ETH, and if you have one ETH and I have one ETH, we have the same type of ETH. There's no like, uh, there's, there's fungibility to it. It's like money, money is fungible. The concept with NFTs is that they're non-fungible. So they're more unique. So that's the, that's the concept with an NFT. And so you see like, oh, someone created an NFT of like a picture, you know? Yes, it's the picture, right, of, the, of what's tied to that NFT, but what it is is it's just a token, but it's a very unique token, right? So the concept is that you create an NFT, um, and the, I talked about Open Zeppelin earlier. Uh, Open Zeppelin is kind of like the de facto way to do certain things. Well, Open Zeppelin wrote the standard contract for how to deploy an NFT. And so that's what we're getting right here. So let's, let's, let's load it up into our browser and just take a brief look at it. We're not gonna go through everything because you guys will be like, what the heck's going on? There's a lot here. But I wanna just show it to you. So the packages folder is very similar. Hardhat, um, React, and then we have some other stuff here, but mainly we're gonna be in React again, contracts, you're collectible. So what do we got here? We have an open Zeppelin ERC721 and you can see it's a lot more con a lot more complex. We're importing a lot of different contracts from Open Zeppelin, basically that allow us to uh, create an NFT, and we're inheriting those here like this. So we import them, we inherit them, and then we have a counter that keeps track of our NFTs. Uh, we set the standard on what it's called, the name of it, the base URI, like where are the images located for the NFT, right? And this is where it's pointed to, IPFS. Right? We have a, a function that allows us to mint NFTs. So the concept of minting is when you create an NFT. So again, all an NFT is a smart contract right? that you deploy on a, um, uh, online. So if you look like Google Board Apes smart contract, you'll be able to look and see the Board Apes smart contract. It's probably almost identical to something like this. Right? But it'll be a little different because it'll probably have a different uh, base URI. It might have some additional functionality. Um, stuff like that. But for the most part, we, we have our contract here. So let's, let's see what it wants us to do. So inside of the, let me close some of this stuff up so we can be a little more clean here. Uh, Speedrun Ethereum, okay. So Speedrun Ethereum is gonna say, all right, do the install, do the chain, do the start, do the deploy. If we need to reset, we can. Now it's gonna walk us through like how to get gas, how to switch your network to the right network, um, which, we already kind of did that, but let's, let's see. Connect, MetaMask, get funds. So we were able to do the same kind of stuff that we've been doing, right? Nothing different. Keeps track of how much ETH you have, how much value. Now we're gonna do minting. Okay, so now we wanna mint. So we can click this little mint NFT button right here. Right here. Mint it. Confirm. Uh, it's gonna say, I think it's gonna want us to switch the network. Let's see. Or maybe I just don't have enough to mint. Let's try to get more funds. Let's grab that. So uh, the old version of Scaffold Eats, you can go here to this faucet right here um, and you can get some more. So I can say boom and I can send more funds if I need to right here. I can also, yeah, so now I should have more. Let's try it again. No, oh, that should be work. Oh, okay, you might get this weird error. <laughs> okay, so I talked about it briefly, but um, your browser uh, MetaMask extension keeps track of your transactions uh, 
with what's, what, what's called a nonce. <laughs> so the reason why we like to use burner wallets is because there's no nonce issues, there's no nonce errors. So you might have to come in here and go to settings and go to general. Uh, actually, it might be not be general. Let's see, advanced, advanced reset. I think. Here we go. No. There we go. Clear, clear nonce data. So if you have, get an error about the nonce, clear it out, and then go back here and try it again. There it goes. Now it works. So again, everything you do on um, everything you do on your wallet is kept track on the Ethereum virtual machine with a nonce. So you start out with a nonce of zero. This is how they keep you from doing double spend attacks. So where you're like double spending your value. It's kind of like if you have a, a dollar in your pocket and you tell someone, oh, well, go buy me a coffee. And then you tell the other guy to go buy me a, a juice. They're all both going to go get it. When they come back, you're only going to have one dollar. It's the same kind of concept. Concept is you do a nonce, and that nonce is your f your first transaction, so that you can't do a second transaction before that value is depleted from your account. So that's the best way to think of a nonce. So again, if you get the error, go in there and just clear your nonces. This is why burner wallets are very useful for like developing locally because you don't have to worry about it. On a test net, you don't have any control over the nonce because it's all on the network. Or on a main net, it's all on the network. Okay, so you can see I minted an NFT, and I just got this like little rhino. <laughs> so this is an NFT, and I could, if I wanted to, come over here to like a new incognito window, go to localhost 3000, and I could take this new address for my uh, other one, and grab funds, get this, and then transfer that over to this person doing a transfer. Confirm, send it over, and now I've transferred this NFT to this burner wallet because I've actually taken that asset. It's just like if I had Ether and I transferred the Ether, but we're transferring the NFT. Okay, so it's gonna, so let's just recap real quick. So you've done all the normal stuff you do with scaffold ETH, but then you get some gas from the faucet. Uh, if you need to reset uh, your stuff, come up here, go to settings, go to advanced, clear your activity tab data like this, if you need to. And then come over here and just mint an NFT. Just click the button. Everything's happening in the background. It's proposing a transaction, minting you an NFT, and it's giving you this kind of like random thing. And you can mint as many as you want. Uh, but, and then you can use those to like trade them around. So it's, it's a very simple example, but it, it does show you kind of like how the NFT works. Um, and it kind of shows you like um, how you could do it manually by going into your collectibles. But what I want to get to now is uh, deploying to a test net. Now you guys, um, in this case, we're using Sepolia, which is a, uh, it's a test net for Ethereum. Um, I don't expect for you guys to be able to do this because you guys are gonna need gas, but I do wanna show you guys how you can do it. There are, so, uh, if you go Sepolia faucet, Ethereum, like this, there's a lot of faucets online. So let's say, let's just go to this first one, Sepolia faucet. You can grab your address from Hardhat or from uh, um, MetaMask like this. You can paste it in here. Uh, it wants us to log in so we can get it. Let's do that. Say I'm not a robot. Choose the bikes. Hit verify and send me some ETH. And it's going to send me some Ether. So again, like Hardhat, we have tons of ETH. It's like our test net, uh, our local net. But when we get to a test net, we need to be able to use the test net. So they give away ETH because they want people to test the network. And so there's a set amount of ETH. So I just transferred some. So let's see if it's available already. Let's go over here. Let's switch to Sepolia. There we go. So now I have 0.5 Sepolia ETH. So you guys can just go to the sepoliafaucet.com if you guys want to do this and follow along. And you can put in your address here. This one, it requires that you sign up for Alchemy. Alchemy is a, I would mention it earlier, they're like a Web3 provider that provides you access to the blockchain. Um, you don't need to really mess with that much, but you just have to create an account there and they'll give you some free ETH, okay? Uh, so let's do it. Let's, let's change the network first of all. So everything we've been doing is through uh, hard hat. Now we're like, all right, we have our smart contract, we built this NFT and we wanna deploy it to Sepolia so that we can tell all our friends to test it, right? So we can come into the hard hat config file, which is inside of packages, hard hat, and go to hardhat config. 
and we can change the default network from localhost, which is you know what we've been using for hardhat, to uh, Sepolia like this. So Sepolia like this. You could also use Gwerly if you wanted. Gwerly is another network. Sepolia, there's a lot more ETH available. Uh, there's there's a run on Gwerly ETH, so Sepolia is the preferred one because it's easier to find a faucet to get the ETH. So use Sepolia. I would recommend that. And then the next change is we want to uh, generate an account. So we've been using these hard hat accounts that come with hard hat. The thing about the hard hat accounts is everyone has the same accounts. So all on your guys' laptops, you guys have the same private keys and public keys as I do. So you don't want to use that key to push your contract to uh, the, the public blockchain because someone's just going to steal your contract and your ETH. Okay? So it's best practice to generate an account that you're going to use as a deployer. So let's do that. Yarn, run, generate. So it tells us here to do a yarn generate. Yarn generate, yarn run generate, same thing. Now, if we look in our, our directory, you'll see right here there's a new file. It's our new deployer account. And that's the address of the account. I'm going to click it. No one steal my funds, but I'm gonna, it gives us the uh, passphrase. So remember how we generated a passphrase with MetaMask? It's the same thing there, we're generating that passphrase. So um, now that I have the deployer account, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fund it, okay? So all I need to do is get the address of it, uh, which if I do yarn account, it's gonna tell me what it is. So here it is. So the cool thing is, there's two different ways you can do this. One is you can just grab the address like this and send some ETH there. So I'll do that right now. I'll go to, uh, my, I'll go to my, my account right here and I will say send ETH to this address. And how much do I want to send? I have 0.5, right? So let me, just, let me send 0.1. So I'll send uh, one fifth of my ETH to my deployer account. It's gonna ask me to confirm. Now it's pending. It takes about 10 to 15 seconds. Now, before we were using hard hat, right? Everything's local, it's fast. But we're using a test net now, so there's actually, I just proposed a network change to the test network. Everyone needs to come in consensus and approve that. So over the next 10 to 15 seconds, everyone's gonna say, all right, well, this guy over here wants to send some ETH to this account, let's update his balance. Is it, does he have the funds? He does, okay, cool, let's propose the change and change the state. And so again, there's this kind of like wait period, right? So let's, it should happen soon. Sepolia is a little bit of a slower network. Um, mainnet Ethereum, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds to do an, uh, uh, a transaction. There it goes, now it's sent. So now I only have 0.4 ETH. I've sent that account uh, funds to here. So if I do Yarn account again, I can see what my balance is on Sepolia. Now I have it right here, 0.01 ETH. So Yarn account will tell me uh, it also gives you this cool QR code. So if you're really savvy, <laughs> you can have a wallet on your phone. So like I'm using a wallet called Punk Wallet here. I could also send some ETH from my Punk Wallet by scanning this QR code on my phone and sending it there. So there's all sorts of interesting ways you can send the ETH, but I just did it from MetaMask because it is, is easy. So now I have a deployer account, sorry. Now I have a deployer account. Now I wanna push this, this smart contract to the test net because it's still local. I, I'm still running it local. So all I need to do is do a yarn deploy. So I can either, I can do, I can do it two ways. I can come over here and change my hard hat config, which I did to Sepolia. And I can do yarn deploy like I would normally do. Or I can do a yarn deploy dash dash network and specify the network. Okay, but we're just gonna, we already changed the config. So let's just do yarn deploy. So again, before, we would just deploy this, it would be real fast, right? Now we gotta wait. So we're gonna take this contract, there it goes, it deployed, seven seconds, not bad. So now our contract is deployed to a test net. And we would, if we grab the address right here, and go to um, Sepolia Etherscan, which is, Etherscan is like a, keeps track of all your transactions for the blockchain, and search, we'll see that here's my contract, it's been deployed. It was just deployed 22 seconds ago. Cool, right? We, we did a testnet transaction. We deployed it from our computer to the thing. So the next step is to ship it, uh, ship our uh, front end. 
So it's going to tell you, all right, well, now you need to go to the React app and change the target network. So everything we've been doing is kind of hard hat related. Let's go into React. Let's go into source and go into target network. So I think it's in an app JSX. Yep, here it is. So network, so right now it's set to localhost. Let's change this to Sepolia, like this. Save it, and then refresh our front end. Uh, where's it at? <laughs> here it is. Wrong network, there we go. Now I'm on Sepolia, right? I'm on the test network Sepolia. I've got my MetaMask connected. You can see it has a balance of 0.4 because we already have it injected. And now I can min an NFT on Sepolia. Confirm. Same thing, it's gonna take you know, a little bit of time for, to, to, for the validation of the, of the transaction. But pretty soon here we should have a, and we can also see that in the Etherscan if we refresh. Uh, let's see, refresh. That one's successful. Sometimes it takes a little longer. There it goes. Now we can see that we have a, a Buffalo NFT. So I've, I've deployed my contract to Sepolia. I've changed my front end to point to Sepolia. I've minted an NFT on the test net. Now if we hit refresh, we'll see that transaction. Here it is. So here's the transaction. It was successful. It has three block confirmations, so people have confirmed it. And there, now I have an NFT on Sepolia. If this was mainnet, I could have a mainnet uh, NFT. So now the, the last step is to uh, take our app, our front end, and do a build. So you can do, uh, there's a couple ways you can do this, but basically you want to take your front end and you want to put it somewhere, right, so that your friends can use it. So there's a built-in command. Uh, what Yarn build is going to do is it's going to take the React app and it's going to optimize it and create a, um, a deployable file. And then you can just deploy that, that uh, JavaScript and HTML and CSS uh, to whatever web provider you want, right? There's a built-in command that I'm gonna do here in a sec called surge. Are you guys familiar with surge.sh? Surge.sh is like a free hosting provider. It allows you to do static file hosting for free. So I'm just gonna, in a sec, I'll just do a yarn surge and it will give me a public URL that I can, everyone here can go to and interact with my smart contract at that point. You can also do Yarn IPFS, which is the interplanetary file system. This is all part of the rabbit hole. As you start building on Ethereum, you'll learn this stuff. Um, if you really want to build your app decentralized, you want to deploy it to a decentralized network for your files, for your uh, front end as well. And so IPFS is a good way to do that. You could technically do that with our Yarn IPFS, but I don't have it configured. But we're going to use search. So let's do search. So it made a build for me. Let's do Yarn search because it's easy. It wants me to register, so let me do that. Kevin at edgeandnode.com. Password, let's make one. And it's gonna tell me, all right, goofy kiss. <laughs> goofy kiss surge.sh. <laughs> That's a good one. I haven't seen a good one like that in a while. So it's just taking my, my project, uploading it, and now you guys can all give me a goofy kiss. <laughs> all right, so we go goofy kiss.surge.sh. So now my front end is deployed. Um, I've got it connected here. I can connect MetaMask with this version, sign it, and I should be able to see my NFT after I connect. There it is. And if you guys went to goofykiss.surge.sh and you had some testnet ETH, then you could mint an NFT as well. So I've, I've built a decentralized application. So now we're at this point where we want to take our um, we want to take our project and make sure it's passing. I haven't touched on this yet, but there's testing framework in Hard Hat as well. So all I have to do is do a yarn test, and let's see if it passes. Did it work? Yarn test. So my contract's deployed, minting works. Um, it's trying to propose a transaction for me. So there's a built-in test that, that verifies that your contract's working. Every build of Scaffold ETH comes with a test already written for you, so it passed. So we know now that my contract's good, it's deployed. So now all I need to do is verify my contract. So in the realm of Ethereum, when you're deploying a smart contract, you want to make sure that uh, people know what your contract's doing. Remember what I told earlier when we first got started, I talked about 
how your contract is compiled down into bytecode. So it's not human readable. So if someone were to look at this right now and go to the account and see, well, let's take a look at the contract. Here it is. Like, well, sorry, where's the contract tab? Contract. Oh, it did already verify it. That's weird. Oh, it's because I've verified this one before. <laughs> Normally, this would not be here. But because I've gone through and did this with, with this account before, it's, it's already verified. But that's OK. It, the, the idea is that you always want to verify your contract so people know what your contract has done. So when you verify it, what it does is it sends a copy to Etherscan. Etherscan compiles it and makes sure that the bytecode that's on the blockchain matches how they compiled it with the version of Solidity you're using. If it matches, then it puts it on the online so that everyone can see it in an open source way. So it's trustworthy. So that way, if I want to if I want to interact with the board eight contract, I can go there, look at board eight, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is what the contract's going to do. All right, it looks secure, it's safe. I'll put my ether in there and get an eight, right? Um, and so that's the concept is you want to verify your contract. So we've already done that. So uh, we want to get validated on our challenge. So we want to flex that we've deployed our NFT. So let's submit the challenge, okay? So let's go to submit challenge. Let's put the URL here of our goofy kiss. <laughs> and let's put the contract URL, which are the contract, uh, what does it want? It wants the contract URL, yeah. So here it is. So we grab this right here, paste it in, hit submit, sign, challenge submitted. It submitted a few seconds ago. Let's refresh. It might take a sec, but it's going to automatically grade it for me. And the, in the back end, there it goes, it accepted. So now I've finished the first challenge of Scaffold ETH. So there's two more, and then I'll get into the build guild right, with this account. Okay, that's, that's the walkthrough. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and do that? We're running behind schedule, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I was trying to go slow so that people could, could follow along, along a little bit. Uh, we might not get to the graph stuff, but maybe I can at least uh, walk you through the graph stuff at some point here. Um, so why don't I give you guys like a 10 minute break and you guys can work through the break if you want. And then when you come back, if you guys have issues during the break, I'll help you. Um, if you want to stay, if you want to go grab a grab, you know, something to drink or something like that, we'll start at um, twelve twenty-one. Does that sound good? Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Is it running? Oh, let's see. Make sure your uh, chain didn't crash. Um, go to your. Tabs. Sometimes the, the chain might crash. Do yarn chain, yeah. Shut down your old chain, yeah? Is it a Search this air online. Oh, <sighs> yeah. What version of Node do you use? Uh, Node dash dash version. Yeah, that's the right one. 
So there, there's some kind of weird thing with like the version of OpenSSL and Node.js and some of the old, <laughs> I think it's old scaffold ETH has issues with certain versions of Node.js. So I'm wondering if you might have to, <laughs> it's annoying, but you might have to temporarily downgrade to 16 to try to, because that's what it's saying here, right? Yeah, this is that. Oh, this is another step. yes, yes, or... yes, you can add this. Yes, this is right. So um, add this to your start uh, inside of package.json. Uh, yeah, oh, did you do it? I oh, so it's uh, it's React app start and then add it to the end of that one. Space uh, space and then make sure you add the T. I think that should. I'll go back real quick and see. So the, the website the scripts. Oh, sorry. Go back to the get rid of start there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that one. Let's try that. Let's see if that works. It's kind of annoying. Do we yarn chain again? Yeah, yeah. It is definitely the same issue that I was having before. Um, go back to the web page again. There's another fix, I think. You scroll. Yeah, it's not boundary. Yeah, no, oh, this. So. Copy that right there. Yeah, grab that. Uh, revert that change that you just did on here. Yeah, put that back to normal. And you'll save that. And put that in your uh, terminal. Paste that and execute it. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> set node underscore options equal dash dash. Yeah, try that. See if that works. Hopefully it does. Anyone else have any issues? No? no? Okay. Yeah. 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 So I was walking through the debug contract. So the reason why this is here is for for you to interact with the contract without having to build a UI for it, right? Um, it's just kind of like a a way for you to test the assumptions of how you, your smart contract works. So the reason this got all populated is because we imported all of those inner, um, open Zeppelin contracts, and so these are all basically everything in this contract is all the values uh, functions that you have available to you when you want to build your front end. So it's really just a way for you to like see that stuff and interact. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so when they're asking me to check the debug contracts here, so <laughs> just to make sure it's working. Yeah, you can you can actually skip all that stuff for now and just do the deploy stuff. Yeah. 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 Keep going from there. Yeah. It, uh, not a problem. Just trying to get a switch over to test mm -hmm. uh, Oh yeah. So hard hat configs at the very top, yeah. and you changed it there. Oh, go all the way to the top. No, 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 no. Um, there you go, where it says local host right there. You are good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Covers the unified screen. Cast price, that's a weird one. Um, uh, that's okay. Go back for a second to it. Shouldn't be yeah. It shouldn't be a hard hat related, but refresh your browser. Hit min min NFT again. Oh, maybe you haven't. Did you deploy it to the test net yet? Because you need to deploy it because you switched the network. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you got now. You got to deploy it to. Um, so did you fund your account? Yes. Oh, cool. There you go. Because, yeah, it's still pointing at hard hat or something. So now it should work. 
There you go. Now we should refer because it's trying. What it was trying to do is trying to figure out what the gas price was, so that you knew how much you needed to pay. Because <laughs> because whenever you propose a trans transaction on the network, your 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 browser your your wallet provider is usually telling you what the current gas price is, so that you know because. If the if the mar if the network's real busy, your gas price is going to be a lot higher than it would if the network is really slow. So you don't want to overpay. I mean, you can overpay; you'll get it refunded to you, but you can't underpay because then your transaction would fail because you run out of gas. So you can almost think of gas like like in your car. If you're going to go to Vegas <laughs> from you know Cal California, you're not going to make it on a full tank of gas, right? Uh, you're probably going to need to stop. Same thing with a transaction. If you're going to propose a transaction and it's going to take you that long, you need to make sure you have enough gas. Otherwise, you're going to break down and the transaction is going to completely fail. It's still the same area. It is? <laughs> no. All right, let's see. Um, log out of your wallet for a second. Click connect again. Wallet connect. Um, let me take a look at your contract uh, real quick, too. We have, did you send the funds to and it deployed successfully? Yeah. Can you show me the terminal for the deploy real quick? Okay. Reusing. Oh, so you already can you can you do a can you grab that address and look on Sepolia Etherscan and see if it actually went cop copy that, yeah. Did it actually deploy? Yeah. It doesn't look like it deployed. So I don't think it was successful. Did you fund that, that deployer account? Do a yarn account again one more time. Because if it does fail, like it'll try to reuse. Uh, so localhost, mainnet. Nope. Yeah, you didn't send enough funds. So okay. grab the address and then cop, uh, send that from MetaMask. You can hit Control C and it'll stop. Yeah, so then try to deploy one more time. Yeah, I just, you just didn't deploy, that's why. Yeah, no worries. <coughs> yeah, yeah, Punk Wallet's really cool. Yeah, so that's what I use, yeah. Uh, it's 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 a the only thing is the punk wallet is not available as a iOS app yet. It's you, it's like a it's a URL browser yeah, um, which is really cool. They're gonna make a, an app. We just haven't gotten around to it. Um, I think there's one in like testnet right now, but it's just not. Well, I'm in the build guild. I'm not building the app uh, for that. I I help out with like this stuff like teaching and I I do some. Some, some development, but we have a whole core team of developers. There's like 20 developers working on the build guild stuff. So I know one of the initiatives is to create the punk wallet, but there's already so many wallets that it's like, it's cool to have a punk wallet, but. <laughs> Anyone else have questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So just hit localhost. It should do it for you. Oh, that's weird. Log out real quick. Uh, can you? Oh, you're using Brave? Yeah. Oh, no. Firefox. Oh, MetaMask. Where, oh, can you bring up the, your pins so I can see the um, your plugins? Uh, I think, yeah, you click that. Click uh, open extension. Yeah, there you go. Oh, and then click Gorley. And then, oh, you don't have it installed, that's why. So add network. Um, go to add network manually on the bottom. Type hard hat. And then it's uh, HTTP colon backslash backslash local, or uh, 127.0.0.1, I think. Oh, I think local is work too. Uh, 8545, port 8545. And then it's 31, oh no, 85. 8545, port 8545. It's hard hat, yeah, it's hard hat, so 8545. Local host? 8545, yeah. 8545, I think. And then the chain ID is 3, 
one three three seven, I think. And then ETH. Yeah. I think that'll work. Is hard out running? Yeah, should be running. Double check. Uh, did it? Did it work now? Oh, go back to your thing just to make sure it connected. There. It goes. How does that work? Because the old, the new version of Scaffold ETH earlier, because you're late, it added it for everyone. So you just had to manually add it. Before the version, the old Scaffold ETH, you have to man manually add it. So that's all. Yeah, no worries. I would pin that to your bar so you can see it if you can. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. The deployer, yeah. Did you create an account? So. Oh, did you get uh, some funds from the faucet or do you already have Sapoli in MetaMask? Or? Oh, go to Sepolia, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, you don't have any ETH. Okay, so yeah, go to sepoliafaucet.com. Copy that. Yeah, copy that address. And then go to sepoliafaucet.com. And then um, you have to sign up for a thing. It's, sorry. Uh, you have to click sign, sign up or log in. Yeah. And then just, you can use your Google account. It's a lot easier. By your human. And then, oh, go back to the Sepolia faucet, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Ah, it should. Oh, it makes you do this stupid. Just say NFTs. <laughs> next. And then do the Ethereum next. Zero free. Uh, uh, skip. Uh, just put whatever. Food. Kevin. <laughs> Okay, there you go. Now paste your address there, and then do I'm not a robot, and send me some ETH. There you go, now you have 0.5 ETH. Then you can just transfer that to your deployer account. If you did the yarn generate, did you do that? Mm -hmm. Then you can do yarn account, grab the address. Um, so if you just type, or you can just grab it right there. Yeah, there you go. And then you can just go into MetaMask, and it should show up any second now. It might take a second. Um, you could probably propose the transaction now, so hit send uh, there, paste the address, and then just send yourself like, I don't know, 0 0.1 or something like that. Um, zero 0.1, yeah, there you go. You might have to put a zero there. Next. I don't know if, um, that's weird. Try, um, just reject it for right now. Uh, that's weird. Oh, there it goes. Oh, no. Oh, did it show up? I think it just showed up. There you go. Now try it again. <laughs> and then you can send over that. You, then you'll have funds in your deployer. Anyone else stuck? Yeah. Still the same error. Still the same error, huh? You have his accounts. Uh, do you yarn deploy dash dash reset? Uh, uh, together, yeah, there you go. Let's see if that works. There we go, so now I got a new account. Refresh your browser. And now try. Yeah, maybe just log in again. Oh, we don't have any funds in this account, so. That's real weird that it's not. Sh oh, are you on the you're on the right network, right? Click here real quick. Yeah, that's. It says you have funds there. It should show up here. Like, there's something wrong with your your front end or something. Oh, connect again. Sorry, I had a mask. Try mint one more time. Mint NFT. Oh, see, it keeps disconnecting, huh? Maybe just restart your front end, and see if. There it goes. Cannot read properties on reading gas price. What? That's so weird. Let's start over. 
That's so weird. Uh, I'm trying to figure out why it's saying that. I didn't touch anything in the front. In the front end at all, right? Um, stop the front end and start it again just to double check. Because I think maybe it, something weird's going on. Oh, uh, no, no, no. It should be your, your window that's already up. So use the your uh, React window. That's that one, the second one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, control C and then just start it again. Hmm. I wonder if it's that. You were able to get around your deploy, though. The deploy worked, right? And it's on Etherscan, right? We have a few open. <laughs> oh, well, it's a new address because you redeployed. So if you want to grab the new one, it's it's there in the terminal, in that third terminal. Uh, yeah, grab the one on the bottom. That's the transaction. Zero X nine. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure, man. Oh, sorry. So I'm starting to run like the unseen now on this new one. Mm -hmm. But it's saying that the hard hat is not recognized as an install. Oh, did you do a yarn install there? Well, I did a yarn install earlier, but it was taking a while. Oh, I think that you might need to do it again there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just do a yarn. Yeah, try it one more time. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So it's here to do it. Okay, sorry, man. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Yeah. Why is this not responsive? I didn't do the burner while the part was already there, so. Yeah, it's not responsive. He's having an issue, too. Um, make sure React is running uh, one more time. That's hard to have. Yeah, it's running. Try maybe control C and then restart it. You're on start. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the Windows machines are probably the ones having the issues because there's some kind of weird thing with Node.js. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got one running. Do you have any problems? Is it with like, the WSL or Node specifically? Are you running Linux? If you're running Windows 10, it might be a problem too. You're running Linux, huh? Hmm? No, I don't think it would be Docker because we haven't even gotten into Docker yet. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would work better, I think, on Linux. Yeah. I mean, I always recommend Linux, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you all good or? Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. I'll answer that question for everyone so that okay. everyone sees that because cool. that's a good question. So. I'm going to cover that. So, um, OK, I know some people are having some issues. Um, hopefully, you guys can get through those. Um, just for the sake of time, we don't have much time. We only have like 30 more minutes. Um, I'll, I'm happy to stay a little later, too, um, and help people if they need it. Or we can always asynchronously try to figure this stuff out. But let's kind of, just for the sake of time, let's kind of keep going a little bit. Um, someone just had a really good question. And I think this is a good point for that. It's like, all right, well now you guys have probably successfully deployed a smart contract. You've kind of seen the value of like, you know, what a smart contract provides. You know, what can you build from here on out, right? Um, where can you go with like this knowledge, at least from an understanding perspective? Um, there's a lot of links in this GitHub that kind of go into more detail uh, that would be very useful for you. Um, some of it is just like curriculum related stuff. Um, but there's a lot of stuff like how to interact with certain protocols. My idea was to try to show you guys the graph stuff. I'm going to at least talk about the graph. I don't think we're going to be able to do the demo of the graph. Um, but for a smart contract, um, and by the way, there is a, let me hold on real quick. Let me pull it up here. Uh, da, 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 da. 
trying to figure out where there's a, a thing, a list of stuff built on scaffold E. I don't know where it is. Okay, well that's okay. Um, you know, the, the idea of a, of a smart contract is, you know, there's obviously this way where you can like interact with the protocol uh, in an economic way. So any kind of exchange of goods, right, when it comes to um, NFTs is a really good prime, prime use case. There's a lot of stuff going around with like digital music, right, like maybe a music NFT platform where people can uh, create NFTs of their music or maybe if you're an artist, you know, you can create art, AI art, or there's a lot of interesting things going on in that realm. Uh, there's also a lot to be said about like the tokenomics aspect of things. Um, a lot of protocols have uh, like some kind of token that helps incentivize people to uh, deploy to that platform. Um, an example would be like there's uh, Uniswap, there's um, uh, some other like DeFi protocols where if you like stake some ETH, you can actually get a return for like having that ETH in the uh, contract. Um, and so there's, there's a, a realm of places that you could go with this, but I would probably venture just to like, you know, go through my, my links here. Um, more stuff about Scaffold ETH is here. There's some workshops. Uh, if you guys are hackers and you're interested in diving more into Ethereum, I highly recommend all of the ETH global hackathons. Um, I'm pretty highly involved with that, um, that organization. They do six events a year, six hackathons in person, and they do another like five or six virtual. So if you guys want, you can uh, partake in that. And each hackathon has a certain theme. The ones that are in, in person are just kind of like general hackathons. So like we just did one in Tokyo. We just did one in, um, we're gonna be doing one in New York, Istanbul. Um, uh, there, there's all these, all these hackathons all over the world. There's also virtual ones, there's one called Hack Money. There's a Hack NFT. Uh, and so there's really use cases where you can get together with a bunch of other like-minded developers who maybe know a little bit about smart contracts. Maybe you have like a, a vision of something you could build with a smart contract and you're a front-end developer, that's like your main thing. Or maybe you're just kind of new to smart contracts. Um, you can get teamed up with other people that are like a little bit more subject matter experts. Um, and you can really start to build some cool stuff. So I would recommend watching videos from all the ETH Global um, finales because the finales, they pick the top 10 and they give out prizes and bounties for uh, building on certain protocols. So an example would be like the graph. Um, the graph gives a bounty, uh, I'll show you like from the last one. Oh, it's not here, but uh, $5,000 USDC to whoever creates the best subgraph, right? Or uh, whoever uh, deploys a uh, second best gets $2,500. And you can actually compete and build some cool stuff. Um, and if you go to the ETH global finales, you'll see some of the ideas that people have, and that might kind of like spark your, uh, your imagination, right, when it comes to this stuff. So definitely check that stuff out. Um, that's a good question. Hopefully that answers your question. I'm happy to talk more about that after. Okay, so if you were if you were able to successfully do this, that's great. If you were not, I'm more than happy to help you in a little bit. But what I would say is here, make sure you join the Discord, uh, sorry, not the Discord, the Telegram channel for Scaffold ETH on here. Because like I said, there's 2,000 developers and they may have had this problem. And you can search that Telegram channel for the errors that you guys are getting and they can help you. And they're really, really responsive. Um, again, there's 20 core developers working on Scaffold ETH that are actually doing like tooling and speedrun Ethereum and Scaffold ETH. But there's 700 builders that have registered that have gone through that Telegram channel. And there's, like I said, there's 2,000 people in there. So you're guaranteed to get some help if I'm not available, okay? Okay, I want to talk about the graph uh, a little bit because I just started at the graph, but I have been a, a graph advocate for a while. Um, and what a graph advocate is, is essentially someone who's like technically sound on the graph and wants to get involved. So anyone here, if you are making this journey into Web3 and you want to start learning more and you've kind of joined the Build Guild, uh, uh, the graph is a critical part to the ecosystem of blockchain applications and Web3 applications. Um, and it's this concept that I was showing you before where there's, the blockchain is great for writing data and keeping track of state and you know acting as a public blockchain. But when it comes to reading data, there's an issue with it because 
You have to actually go through and parse all the events, and it's not a very good uh, state machine, historical state machine. It really is designed to give you the current value of state at this current time. It doesn't really have a very good historical um, record. Not to say that you can't query the blockchain for a previous block, but it's a lot of work to do it because the blocks are on top of each other. And if you wanted to go all the way back to the beginning of Ethereum and find out transactions for a wallet, you'd have to go through each one and search it and parse it. And it would take forever in your front end. And so um, we already talked about Web3, the concept of decentralization, no servers, right? That's kind of like some of the, the benefits of, of Web3 is you deploy your application, hopefully in a way where you don't really need server infrastructure, they're immutable. Um, and there's like breaking free from authorities. <laughs> it's a funny slide. Um, but I already showed you the basic stack is you have like a UI is like React or Next.js. Then you have like an API that makes calls to a smart contract or some other infrastructure protocol using like gRPC. Um, but there's one problem like I mentioned before. Uh, the, the blockchain, again, it was really designed at first as just a way to transact and send values and keep track of like basic state. Smart contracts have really expanded a lot over the years, and uh, blockchain reading data from the, from the blockchain is a little bit uh, of a problem because it's slow. And if you think about all the protocols that are out there, there's lots of, of protocols. Uh, Uniswap, uh, Aave, Uma, Foundation, NFT, which is an NFT uh, platform, Zora. There's all these protocols and there's a lot of noise on the blockchain, right? There's a lot of transactions going on, and, you saw earlier when I was browsing through a transaction, it's a little convoluted to get the data you want. And so if you are building a front end, and this is real code that's, that we saw in production of someone, where they're actually going out and they're getting the balance of a specific smart contract and they're having to kind of iterate over this loop. And each time it's making a contract call that takes a, you know, a couple hundred milliseconds. So if you have a large amount of data that you're trying to read from the blockchain, it can easily take three to eight or even longer amount of seconds to get all the data you need for your application. Yeah? That last slide. This one. Is there a contract between these entities? Like, say, like, if you send you something, are you going to get this? So these are all separate contracts. Um, there are proxy contracts. that You can do a proxy contract where one contract can call another contract. Right. But for the most part, these are all individual contracts and people are interacting with them with their wallets, externally owned accounts. Um, and so you can think of these transactions, they're not necessarily between each other, but there are contract calls that get made between contracts as well. Because you can import another contract and you can use it, uh, and you can do a proxy call as well. So yes, proxy, it's called a proxy contract. So it can get, a, it can get confusing with all this stuff going on, right? So again, if you're trying to read data from the blockchain, it's a little difficult to do out of the box is what the point is. Um, so this is what the graph aims to solve. So the graph is uh, an, a, a single API for decentralized data or bl blockchain data. And it's based on GraphQL. So if you don't know GraphQL, GraphQL is this very powerful API language that allows you to create a request based on what you want to see as opposed to having to get the whole request and then parsing it and getting rid of the data you want, it's a very, um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word right now, but you can essentially decide how you want to query the, the, that's why it's called a graph query language. It's a query language uh, for APIs. And uh, it allows you to uh, really just make one API call as opposed to having to do, to do this for loop, right? You can just get the data you want in one call and it, if anyone's a friend of dev, you'll know that like GraphQL is very powerful. And so the graph serves about 1 billion queries a day. So it's, it's getting a lot of traction. There's a lot of queries from like um, uh, DeFi protocols um, and then also like NFT protocols. Um, and we're growing the network to support more stuff as well. Um, so it's, it's a decentralized index network protocol. And I, I like to think of it as a middleware for blockchain data. So your front end goes through uh, the graph the graph is using that kind of middleware to give you reliable data from the blockchain. So something like this gets organized into these little separate buckets called subgraphs. So you can think of a subgraph as a database. You can create a subgraph, and these are all companies that have, have subgraphs available. So let's say you're gonna build a dApp, 
uh, and you want to utilize, uh, I don't know, you want to utilize a Aon Foundation, which is that second one, which is an NFT platform, and you want to see their top 10 NFTs that they've sold in the last hour, and maybe you want to like tell people about that on your app. Well, you can just query the subgraph to get all that data you want uh, using GraphQL. Um, and you don't have to have your own database. You know, you use the GraphQL's network, and you, do, you pay for your queries using GRT, which is a token, right? So it's kind of like a, a, an API key. And you can sign up for a free API key on the website for 1,000 queries for free if you want to try it out. So this is kind of what it looks like for uh, GraphQL, is you have this user interface. Um, people connect through their, your DAP to write directly to the blockchain. But when you're reading, your, index, your events are getting indexed into the graph and being highly available on the graph network so that you can uh, parse that information using the GraphQL API. Uh, and so what you're ended up with is something like this, which is a very simple GraphQL query where it says, all right, well, like this, in this case, we just want to get the owners of a specific NFT and we want to just list that in one simple GraphQL query. So we're, all we care about is the ID, the token ID, the metadata, and maybe like previous owners. Uh, of that NFT. And maybe if you don't want the metadata, you just remove that and then send the query again and then it would just not give you the metadata because you don't care about it. So it's a really way to optimize a query uh, for, for blockchain data. Uh, how much time do we have? 15 minutes, okay. So yeah, it's a decentralized network. Uh, there's about 150 indexers worldwide. Um, the idea is that the data lives on the indexer. So all of you could become an indexer if you wanted to. Um, it, there is a somewhat of a complicated step to do it, but you can actually become an indexer and you can get paid to host data as well. So like let's say you have a server running somewhere and you want to create an uh, indexer, um, you can get paid a um, percentage of the queries that happen to your indexer and those indexers are growing uh, as the network expands. Um, and the idea is to just to provide fast, cheap and reliable data um, and provide a global open API for this data. Um, and you know this this might you know right now like I said there's a lot of networks that are supported but this also might eventually expand into even like Web two data as well right maybe like a Web two company wants to to put their data on the graph it's possible right so yeah the whole whole general idea is that the graph wants to help support truly decentralized apps uh, so building your app in a way that is again decentralized open and anyone can interact with it. So if you want to get started on um, uh, subgraph development, oh, this is kind of like a high level overview. This is, this is useful. Um, we talked about how ADAPT works in the very beginning. You, you have this, this decentralized application. Let's just say it's written in like React or Next.js. People are interacting with it and they're making transactions. And so those transactions are made to the smart contract. So the smart contract you can see on the right. And as that smart contract uh, receives a transaction, you configure what's called events. We didn't really get into it much, but events is kind of like a log. So it's a cheap way to do a log and notify people that are listening to the contract on what's going on. But more importantly, it's to notify your front end when something's changed. So if someone has proposed a transaction, the event will get emitted to the network and you have a listener in your application normally that would say, oh, there's an event. Let me update the UI so that maybe I need to show a new NFT that's available. You know, like if you see earlier when I minted an NFT, we were subscribing to an event and it took a second for it to show up. So what the graph does is it has this thing called the graph node, which is basically just a, a service that's running that takes in those events and it does it through a WASM module, which is uh, written in assembly script. And you define how you want your data to be stored on the blockchain. So let's say you have 10 events in your smart contract, right? Like uh, here we have these events. Uh, in this case, we have a transfer event. Uh, well, let's just say we have one in the, in, the, in the NFT example I did earlier. We want to keep track of the transfers. Well, we're keeping track of the who it came from, where it went to, and then the token ID. So you can create a, a custom subgraph using this kind of scenario where it just grabs that data and every one time someone transfers an NFT or mints an NFT, it gets published to the graph node and it gets stored uh, in the graph node. And then instead of your DAP having to query the events, it can just query the GraphQL API to get that data. So it's kind of like an optimized way to avoid having to call the blockchain to get your data. 
you just parse those events and push them into the, the graph. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions about that? And my, my goal today was to try to get you guys through a full graph demo. We obviously didn't make that, but it's okay. The, all the instructions are gonna be in my blog post that I wrote. So I wrote this blog post. It's the same concept as what we've been doing. Talks about scaffold E, talks about why you should use the graph, what value it brings. It tells you how to set up scaffold E, which we've done twice already, so now you get to do it again. Um, the difference is, is that it's a special build, a special branch of scaffold E2. So this one uses scaffold E2. And once you do that, it's the same concept. You do the install, do the chain, do the start, do the deploy, and you get up and running. The difference is, when you get to the graph, this is all running in Docker. Okay? So there's a special d directory called packages subgraph. Uh, you can run yarn clean node after you get into that directory and it'll clean up any data that's in there. If you ever want to reset it, that's how you clean it up. I just show you that. All you do is yarn run node. It's going to spin up all the containers for you in Docker. So there's three containers that run. One is the graph node container. One is Postgres SQL because it uses Postgres. And one is IPFS, which is the Interplanetary File System Simulator. So it runs locally. Uh, IPFS, I didn't get into it much, but it's a decentralized file sharing network. The, the graph uses that to store its data permanently. And uh, you might get an error. This is how you fix the error. Um, there's like some kind of weird thing with like, uh, I don't know, this environment variables. You have to change the locale if you're running Mac. If you're running Windows, it doesn't pop up. But anyways, uh, so then you just run a node. And you'll get the same kind of idea. You'll get your uh, blockchain up, you get your hard hat up, but then now you'll have the graph running in Docker in this third one. Then your fourth window is where you'll do your deploys like you normally were doing earlier, right? Then you create a subgraph. If you do yarn local create, it creates it for you. It does all the work for you. That's really useful because subgraphs are a little confusing. But in my blog post later on, I, for, then you ship it. But later on in the blog post, I explain how to change and update a new subgraph with a new event. So I walk you through it. So by this time, you've got the graph up and running. And then here's an example GraphQL query that you can do. You can see how pretty and easy it is to read. Uh, you can customize it. In this case, we're getting all of the greeting counts. Remember how we were updating the greeting earlier? This is how you get the first 25, right? So imagine you're only making one API call to get 25 fields of data versus having to make 25 RPC requests and loop through them, right, with Scaffold Eats or with React, sorry. Um, and so then you get this cool, pretty uh, GraphQL Explorer as well that you can toy around with where you can make the call and see the data and it comes back in a data object. And then you can build your front end uh, around this. And then I, talk, I walk you through how to add additional events how to change your entity, and this gets a little more complex, and this is where you start learning about how to, how to do more advanced stuff with the graph. But this is really easy. You can literally follow, copy, paste all this, and go along, and it will get you to a state where you have the graph running, you have scaffold ETH running, and the front end is also plugged in with the graph automatically too, so you can start parsing your events from the graph as opposed to using the event handler in scaffold ETH. So we got 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'm sorry we didn't make it through everything, but um, it's a learning experience. This, I found out last night that we were doing uh, a three hour workshop. I thought it was only an hour. <laughs> so I, I overestimated how, how fast we could get through. So apologies that we didn't make it through, but um, I'm an open book. So if you guys have questions after and you, you're not able to catch me, just let me know. I'm happy to help you guys. Uh, any questions? Yep. You want to see the graph deployed? Yeah. Sure, I can try to bust through it. Uh, let's do it. Let's let's try. So like, uh, let's let's do it. So we already have. Well, let's see. Um, I think I already have a, 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 a version of it deployed. Let's see. Ethereum uh, projects. Ethereum CD uh, scaffold ETH two dash subgraph demo. There we go. Yarn. I think I already did the yarn. See? Yarn chain. Yarn. Oh. 
projects, Ethereum's Gapple Deep dash two dash subgraph, yarn start. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, I need to close down my other chain, sorry. Yarn start. I just can't guarantee that um, it's all fully set up. Let's see. Uh, yarn start. Let's try that. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now we'll go to a CD projects, Ethereum, scaffold v dash two, dash subgraph package, yarn deploy, dash dash resets. Now we can see what do we gotta do. So we gotta do yarn run node. Let's see if I am able to do that. Actually, I gotta go here first. Yarn clean node, yarn run node, let's try it. Oh, yarn run node. Oh, I gotta go into the subgraphs packages, subgraph yarn run node. So like, this is where we're running, um, make sure Docker is up, which it is. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, I really do. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so now we got Docker running up. Let's see if it's gonna give me those errors, because uh, takes a second. No, that's just what the developers prefer, I think. Um, so yeah, you can use either one. Uh, okay, CD projects, Ethereum, scaffold deep dash two, dash subgraph package. All right, so now we go into yarn run node. Okay, so let's see, we'll go yarn local create. Packages, subgraph, yarn local create. So this is where we're creating the subgraph. It's gonna do it for us, basically. Uh, it's gonna go through our ABI, uh, or maybe there's just an automatic, maybe there's just a template there for you that already is written for this smart contract, which is just a basic event that says, here's the greeting, I'm updating it. Uh, so I've already created it, now I can ship it. So yarn local ship. So now I'm gonna take my subgraph and I'm gonna deploy it to my graph node running inside Docker. It's gonna tell me what version I wanna do. So let's just say it's the first version. We'll do 0.0, .0 right, we'll do five just because I, I may have already deployed it. So we'll go to five. It was successful. Now we have our query right here. So we can go to scaffold E uh, slash your your dash contract, let's see. There we go. So now we have this qu query, so we need to actually interact with our DAP request real quick, so let's do that real quick. Let me go to wrong network, switch to hard hat. Oh, let me just disconnect this too. Let's use the burner wallet. Connect wallet, burner, get some funds, debug contracts. Let's update our example UI to uh, I love render ATL, boom, 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 send. So I sent a transaction, jeez. I sent a tra transaction, it updated. So now I can assume that because I have uh, IPFS running, PostgreSQL, graph node, it's already configured uh, with the template that comes with this branch that we can see my data. So let's come over here and let's do that. Let's grab that uh, query, which is in the blog post, uh, which is right here, just to make it easy so I don't have to like write it in there and hit play. There we go. So that's our GraphQL data right there. So we literally have one simple API now. So if I come back in here and do like, um, I do too, the send, hit refresh again, and I'll get the new one. So it takes a couple milliseconds for it to go into a graph. And now we're just querying the GraphQL API to get this data. And then inside of our front end, uh, let me quit this real quick. Let me open up this. Uh, code dot, I just want to show you real quick. Inside of uh, the Next.js package and inside pages and then inside, uh, where's it at, where's it at? Services, no, where's it at? Pages app, components. Components, then generated 
not generated, uh, example UI, contract data. Is this the right one? I think this is the one, yeah. So if you, if you were to diff this file, so inside of Next.js, components, example UI, contract data, if you were to diff this with the version of the scaffold ETH, you wouldn't see this kind of GraphQL query that we're doing. Um, and you'll notice here that we get a copy of our, our greetings with that query that we're doing. And we are doing a use query to, do, to call it, basically. We're doing GQL. And we're getting that in a console log. So right here, we have the whole object. So now if I go into my app real quick, and I go to Scaffold ETH, and I go to View, Developer, Developer Tools, Refresh, I can see that object under Console. Here it is, greetings data. And now we can see that I have that whole object available to me inside of Next.js. So if I wanted to parse this, I, you know, if I wanted to build a UI, I could just use this object to get the data, get the greetings, and then here's my two greetings, zero and one. And there it is. I love render ATL, I do too. Let's say I wanted to change this to uh, ascending versus descending. I could make that small change. Come here, refresh, and now I could go back to my date greetings data, go to data, greetings, and they're switched. Now it's live over under ATL on the top. So you can do this cool manipulation of your data and query of your data using that. So that was a speed run of the graph. <laughs> I know that was fast, but hopefully you guys got the idea. Um, I'm going to record a video of this. I haven't done it yet. I need to, but uh, I'll post it on YouTube. Um, I, I have a YouTube channel. It's Kevin Jones. Uh, sorry, it's Crypto Mastery Podcast. I do a podcast. So if anyone wants to talk about crypto, let me know. Um, and I, I post videos on there. So I'll do a, a walkthrough of this more thoroughly, but hopefully the blog post is a good starting. I, hopefully that helps you. All right, next question. Someone else had a question. Yeah. Oh, you go first. Okay, I just want to know about the error. If you run into errors, how can you tell me if Yeah, I mean, as far as like, well, there's two, there's three parts of the errors. <laughs> there's one is like React or Next.js. The error handling is pretty, pretty good. They've, they've done a good job of like showing you what's going on in the UI. It can get a little convoluted <clears throat> when you get messages back from the blockchain uh, on like what's going on because sometimes if it's like you're trying to read the object and it's like you know byte byte code, um, you need some kind of pretty way to to, to show it. Um, that's still like an avenue of like uh, not mastered in the realm of Ethereum. So. Yeah, to make the, yeah, so like an example, when you sign a transaction, sometimes you don't know what's going on, it's just, you can see some bytecode. Yeah. So good developers have implemented some stuff like that. The stuff that Scott does is very basic, so it does a good job of trying to tell you. Uh, the error handling for hard hat is really good because it, it tells you inside the console here what's going on. If you get an error. Yeah. The deploy log stuff, like yard deploy, the hard hat deploy, pretty good error handling. You can find the errors of your deploy. So yeah, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. That's a great question. And if you read my blog post at the bottom, I touch briefly on that problem. Where's it at? So what next? <laughs> so in this next blog post that I'm planning to write, I talk about the, I'm gonna talk about the Graph CLI and Subgraph Studio. So Subgraph Studio is the decentralized way for you to deploy a, a subgraph. And I didn't do that. We do it everything locally. But you could, same thing, you come here, you connect your wallet, hit next. And you can create, sign and create an account. Um, Kevin at edgeandmo.com. Uh, receive billing alerts. Okay, cool. Create a subgraph. Uh, Kevin's subgraph, like this. Select the blockchain you want. So if you're gonna do, and sorry, it's hard to read, but Ethereum, create subgraph. And then you'll have the subgraph template, and it walks you through how to do it here. So here's where you install the CLI. So we can do a yarn globe ad, global ad, like this. Oh, I don't know why that's not working. 
Um, there we go. It's because I was in a yarn package already. But the, you can install the CLI, and then you can initialize your subgraph here, like this. And if you're in a project that has a contract already, uh, you can do uh, dash dash index events like this. And what it'll do is look at your, uh, your smart contract and create events for you automatically and build out a subgraph for you automatically. And then you hit enter. It's not going to work now because I don't have a, a, a project there. Uh, and then from there, you can authenticate and deploy the subgraph. And here, you're deploying it to a staging environment. Um, but eventually, you can publish it. And you can pay. So you get, like, if you publish it to the, um, the main net, you, know, you just have to pay for your reads. Um, but this walks you through everything. So in a subgraph, it includes the Yeah. Yeah. So the, sub the subgraph is exactly that. It's basically like a, a data object, storage object for your smart contract. Yeah, yeah this, these are really good questions. Any other questions? Yeah? So you had mentioned you only have to pay for a read, so what about writes? Um, that's a good question. So to push the data, to the blockchain. I don't know exactly how that works. I've never, I've never pushed a mainnet, so I'm, but I'm pretty positive that you just you put the data there, and then people have to signal to kind of like it's called it's like a signal, basically like promote the subgraph and store it, and then that's kind of how you you know people do that, and they kind of stake some GRT to allow that to be read, and then they get paid on the reads. So yeah, it's a little gray there, but um, I don't think you have to pay to just put it up for initially. Maybe you do. Sorry, I don't know the answer. Yeah, another question? I really appreciate you guys like getting through this stuff and uh, being here today. Um, really, really stoked that you guys followed along so well. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Um, I know it's time for lunch, so I know you guys might be hungry. So I'll let you guys go. But if, I'll be around for a couple more minutes if you guys have questions. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys.